Welcome back. Let's continue on with uh, chapter 26 and hopefully uh, finish things up. So uh, I'd like to cover how it is that one can make amino acids in the lab. So I'm not talking about biosynthesis here. I'm talking about uh, ways of, of making them in the flask, so to speak. Uh, and we talked earlier about treating alkyl halides of all types with excess ammonia. And um, this generally doesn't work well, as you'll recall, unless we use a very large excess of ammonia. But that's one way of uh, making amino acids, as you can see here. I'm indicating a racemic mixture here because most likely uh, in real life, one, would, uh, one wouldn't bother trying for uh, an antimerically pure bromide since this reaction goes through a mixture of SN1 and SN2. I figure because this uh, substrate is secondary, so it can go either way. And I think you're going to get a mixture of the enantiomers at the end, no matter what you do. Uh, a somewhat cleaner way of doing the same thing that I'm really shocked your book doesn't mention is the Gabriel synthesis, which we talked about in chapter 24. It's a method of making amines, and if you uh, took an alkyl halide of this type and you treated it with the anion coming from thalamid, and then you baked it in aqueous base, or you could also use hydrazine here, H2N, NH2. Uh, either way, that will cleave out the amine portion and you'll get your amino acid. So that could also work in principle. And there are some other ways, too, that I will I'll leave you to read on your own about uh, and to explore in the OWL. But, uh, but those are two real obvious ways that this is done. Uh, both of these would require uh, separating the enantiomers at the end, which is not particularly cheap or easy. But, but there are ways of doing that. Uh, okay, what about actually connecting together two amino acids to make a dipeptide? Well. Uh, over here in my uh, class notes, I almost said one does not simply walk into Mordor, but one cannot simply mix the two amino acids in uh, aqueous acid and hope for the best. Because if your goal is to connect this carbon to this nitrogen, well, you will get some of that. You'll also get this carbon connecting to that nitrogen and this carbon connecting to this nitrogen of another one, and the same thing over here, and trimers and tetramers. So you'll, you'll get a huge mess in the end. You won't get anything useful out of that. There's no way to control which two, uh, which two groups condense to make the, the amide bond, the peptide bond. So our way around that is to, I say our, I, I'm no, uh, no biochemist, of course, but uh, my understanding is that the industry's way around that is to, first of all, protect uh, your two amino acids so that in the one case, the carboxylate group cannot react because it's covered up with another group, protected. And in the other case, the amino group can't react. That will force the amino acid of one particular, or sorry, that will force the amino group of one particular amino acid to react with the carboxylate group of the other one. And so you get just one product out at the end. And it's very straightforward to protect a carboxylic acid uh, by making an ester. This is just a Fischer esterification reaction. And of course, under acidic conditions, you'll certainly first protonate this again, but that will then go through the exact same mechanism that we've already covered, and you'll get the methyl ester. Uh, and with the, with the carboxylate group, with the carbo carboxylic acid group protected, I anticipate you'll be able to isolate the free amine base over here. And uh, in order to protect the amine, we generally, I say we again, I guess I can't help it, but one generally protects it as what, uh, uh, by what's known as a carbamate or urethane functional group. And one very common reagent is this one here, tert-butoxycarbonyl chloride, or you could also call that tert-butyl chloroformate. And chloroformate esters are kind of uh, an acid chloride on one side and an ester on the other. And they behave just like any other acid chloride. We've already seen how, uh, how um, an amino group can, uh, or an amine in general can react with an acid chloride and you'll get an amide. It's an aminolysis of an acid chloride. And the very same thing would work over here. 
So uh, the short form, you may see tert-butoxy carbonyl chloride, abbreviated as BOC-CL. So this is your BOC group. And likewise, uh, that group can be uh, abbreviated also. Let's just move another one over here. Uh, you can actually abbreviate the whole group that way. And so you can just write the entire molecule. I hope this doesn't turn it around to Cobb. Let's see if it works. Yup, Cobb it is. <laughs> oh my technology. Well, let's do this. Text, um, flush write. There we go. So you can also, that's another way of writing the exact same compound. And it doesn't have to be a Bach group. There are other uh, carbonyl chloride derivatives. Instead of a tert butoxy group, you can also have a benzyloxy group. That's another one that's sometimes used. Again, that horrible word benzyl. So instead of O tert butyl, I mean O CH2 phenyl. And that one will work much the same way. It's another uh, um, aminolysis of an acid chloride. So now with these two compounds in hand, now we can treat this with DCC, which is our coupling reagent that will uh, uh, condense the carboxylic acid in the amine in order to form a new amide functional group over here. And so uh, uh, DCC is the reagent of choice, dicyclohexyl carbodiamide. So we went, over, uh, we went over the structure of that one. And uh, now then is a good time, I think, to go over the mechanism of that reaction. And uh, I think just as always with such reactive compounds, same with acid chlorides and acid anhydrides, I think we can assume there's going to be some acid around. So this is probably done under slightly acidic solution. So uh, what we're going to do over here, I have a Bach protected glycine. So I just have CH2 here just to keep things simple. Uh, and we're going to react that down the road with a, with a methyl ester protected glycine, with the free amino group. So this all looks terribly frightening, but it's only partly because there are several steps and partly because the molecules are so big and complicated. But uh, other than that, I don't think there's anything here you haven't seen before. This is essentially uh, another, another couple of um, uh, carbonyl addition reaction. So just like always, we're going to want to start by protonating. Uh, if it were a carbonyl oxygen, we'd protonate the oxygen, but instead we'll protonate our nitrogen. This is going to occur under acidic conditions. After that, this central SP hybridized carbon is now even more electrophilic. And it's electrophilic enough even for a moderate nucleophile like a carboxylic acid. Actually, moderate might even be flattering a little too much. Uh, I would call that, as a, as a nucleophile, mediocre at best, but certainly still nucleophilic enough to attack that central carbon. And then, as is so often the case, we're going to need to do a couple of proton transfers, better bring the charge of this kind of anhydride-looking oxygen back to zero. And then we can use a hydronium ion to protonate this carbonyl oxygen. That's now going to suffer nucleophilic attack by the free amino group from the other uh, uh, C-protected glycine residue, the one that's the methyl ester. And that gets us to this intermediate. So continuing on the next page, as we said, the amino group is a more than good enough nucleophile to attack that carbonyl carbon. And then the only part that's in some ways new, and yet not really, uh, this species can quickly decompose uh, by a six-member transition state. One thing we've stressed quite a bit in class is that four-member transition states are in general a no-go. I can't say they never happen. We saw one example where they did, namely the Wittig reaction. And that was extraordinary because phosphorus and oxygen love each other so much. Those bonds are so strong that even uh, if it requires a four-membered transition state and four-membered intermediates, the reaction will proceed. Uh, however, if a reaction can go through a five- or six-membered transition state, that, now that's an extremely low-energy pathway. Uh, all of the atoms are, uh, uh, can easily line up uh, in the shape of a six-membered ring. You can think of this actually as being a concerted uh, six electron uh, movement of six electrons, let's say, 
in some ways, it's not all that unlike a uh, Diels-Alder reaction, except that this is involving some sigma bonds as well as a pi bond. In any case, once that happens, our dicyclohexyl urea byproduct falls off. We don't really care about that. The other piece is just this protonated dipeptide. And so our last step is just to use a water molecule, which is uh, uh, plenteously available, to pull off that proton, and we get our new, bi new dipeptide. And incidentally, there then are ways of taking off just the Bach group and reacting this with, the, uh, with another Bach-protected amino acid, or you can uh, deprotect the, the methyl ester, and you can treat then the free carboxylic acid with the unprotected amino group of another methyl ester-protected amino acid. And this is now, by the way, all automated. So there's industrial methods that essentially do all this automatically. So... That's all I really have here, and I think, again, that will be some good background for those of you going on in uh, biochem, but whether or not you're going on in biochem, uh, I feel that uh, this material really dovetails well with a lot of the other things that we've been discussing. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, carbonyl addition and condensation reactions. Uh, again, the different reactivities of, of, the, of the amino and carboxylic acid groups, uh, the whole issue of pKa and ionization state. So I think it's a good review of a lot of really basic topics from this term. So uh, other than that, uh, ultimately, we'll be continuing on with uh, chapter 22, I believe. Let me just make sure I'm not lying. Yep, looks like chapter 22 and we'll cover uh, carbonyl alpha substitution reactions. So until then, stay well, and we'll see you next time.